Welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman, a podcast loaded with practical tips, powerful scripts, personal stories, and simple steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. So get ready to get the information you need to make the impact you want from someone you trust, your friend, parenting expert, Dr. Robin Silverman. Hello and welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything, where we give you the tips, scripts, stories, and steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. I'm so honored to be your host, Dr. Robin Silverman, child and teen development specialist, author and speaker, and most importantly, parent of two great kids who give me the honor of helping them through all of this every single day, whether I want to or not. Believe me, I get it. It's not always easy, but we're in this together and we have some great people helping us along the way. Now, unless you live under a rock, and I know you don't, you know that kids and adults are provided with a fire hose of information every day. Kids have the information they are learning in school and what they get from learning in communities and from their culture. They have incredible amounts of articles and videos and books and films and online posts and other media that tell them what to think and why to think that way. Of course, much of the information that they gain isn't exactly fact. They are opinions or facts filtered through various lenses and perspectives. What if we taught our children and teens how to think critically about the information that they are receiving? How can they become aware of their biases, their privileges, their beliefs, their loyalties, their perspectives, as well as all of those things for other people who are talking to them so that they're not empty vessels to be filled up uh, with all this different information, but people who examine what they're looking at with discernment and curiosity. That's what we're going to be talking about today. And we have the pleasure of having Julie Bogart to help us explore it. Now, Julie is known for her common sense parenting and education advice. She's the author of the beloved book, The Brave Learner, a great book, which has brought joy and freedom to countless home educators. Now, her new book is Raising Critical Thinkers, and it offers parents a lifeline in navigating the complex digital world that our kids are confronting. And in my opinion, not just the digital world, but just like life. Okay. Julie's also the creator of the award-winning innovative online writing program called Brave Writer, now 22 years old, serving 191 countries. She home educated her five children who are globe-trotting adults. Today, Julie lives in Cincinnati, Ohio, and can be found sipping a cup of tea while planning her next visit to one of her lifelong learning kids. Welcome, Julie, to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Gosh, what a pleasure it is to be here. Well, I'm excited to have you. This, I loved this book, and I I read it cover to cover as I do with preparing for these interviews. I really enjoyed it. It just sucked me in. But before we get into all of the great things that you write in there, can you tell me what gets up, what got you up in this, this morning and what gets you up every morning and what got you so interested in teaching critical thinking skills to kids? So I love thinking about thinking. I think Mm -hmm. it is something I can trace back even to my youth, but I would say that the advent of the internet in my late thirties really brought it to a crescendo. There was something about having been in the analog world for half of my life, and then suddenly this invitation to what felt like an ongoing cocktail party all (laughs) over the globe uh, that really appealed to my extroverted nature. I was one of those early adopters who had a utopian vision. You know, the internet is going to help us have kumbaya love. We will get (sighs) to know people from all over the planet, and we will be better for it, right? Right. And interestingly, I was in a very homogeneous home educator community at the time. We were all similar backgrounds, similar religious beliefs. Most of us were heterosexual and married. We had children. We were stay at home moms. We would gather at these sort of water cooler online chat rooms 
And I expected us to agree. And we got into blood baths over really silly things like breastfeeding or whether OxyClean was a reliable stain remover, right? Whether or not we should let a child cry through the night, what we believed about a certain theological tenet, what our political beliefs were. It was so startling to watch people that I assumed I would like attack each other. And it happened swiftly. Mm. So by the early 2000s, I was being confronted with this wide array of opinions. I started seeking out new ideas from people I didn't know. And the next thing you know, I was asking fundamental questions. How do I have the beliefs I have? Mm. Which communities have shaped them? Why am I so fiercely devoted to protecting and defending them? And why are other people too? Mm. Mm. I, I think those questions are really fascinating. And when it comes down to it, these are questions that can be asked in such a variety of different ways in a variety of different situations, online or otherwise. Right. Now, you say that critical thinking is more than critiquing somebody else's ideas. And and I, I completely agree with this. It's It's also being able to question your own, which I feel like has been something that has has really come to a head of late uh, that that you are coming with your own biases. You remind us that context is king and we need to consider perspective, angle, what information you yourself are bringing to whatever you're learning and how that's been being told, what's being left out. I loved like what, who is being left out when you said yes. that. How can we help our kids to understand the importance of critical thinking and separate bias from belief or facts from interpretations? Oh, so that's a very big question. Let's start small. Yeah. So one of the things that uh, I like to share is that my book title, the working title was Raising Self-Aware Thinkers. And my publisher came back and said, let's get it in the critical thinking space because that's where educators and parents are looking. But for me, critical thinking starts with self-awareness. Mm -hmm. It starts with recognizing where I'm standing in relationship to whatever information is coming to me. So one of the ways we identify bias is actually checking in with our reactivity. Mm -hmm. So imagine you're on Facebook and your friend posts an article and it does not align with the views that you already have. One of the ways you know that's true is your heart rate goes up. You might notice that you want to immediately respond with a different fact. You might read the article and you skip data that's not interesting to you or that doesn't go with your belief. And you're looking for the one flaw that you can pull out to zing them. Yes. These are the pieces of critical thinking that are necessary to appreciate before you can even give what we might call a fair hearing or at least um, a curious hearing. Sometimes when I use language like fair or open-minded, people think that means that they're being invited to agree or empathize. When really what we're asking is, can we pay attention to what was at stake for the writer without interjecting um, our own perspective? So starting first with my reactivity and then pivoting to, well, why is the writer framing it this way? What's at stake for them? Mm. I mean, the whole thing is really fascinating. So if we imagine sitting with a child Perfect. who, or a teen or a tween, I'm going to say tween or child who has watched a news segment or a program that depicted race or gender or sexuality in a certain way, what kinds of questions would we ask to get them to critically think, just as you were saying, about what they just saw and the messages that they gleaned about race or gender or sexuality while watching it so that they don't just sit there as an empty vessel and think whatever they're seeing is the facts for everybody. So those issues, those arenas are so big yeah. that I like to lay a foundation with something that is lower stakes 
And then we build our way with our children to being able to ask similar questions, but inviting them to think it through. So in one of my opening chapters, I talk about an experience I had with my oldest son when he was three. He became obsessed with the three little pigs story. I Loved told it. it to him repeatedly in the bathtub when we would take walks. We got to the point where he could even join in with me at the huffing and puffing, right? He really loved it. One day we went to the library and a book by John Shoshka was on one of those end caps of one of the library racks. And it was called The True Story of the Three Little Pigs. Which so we I, have in our in on our bookshelf too. So yeah, that's, that's a great right. one. And of course, you know, my kids are older. So this was right when it came out. So I did not know what the content of the book was, but I was intrigued because the wolf was on the cover. So I brought it home and I read it to Noah, who was like almost four, three or four. And his eyes widened because until that moment, he had never considered that there was more than one perspective about this story. He had received uncritically the sort of omniscient narrator, my mother is telling it, authoritative view. And, and repetitive, right? And because of repetition, it carried the weight of truth, regardless of whether it had ever been vetted, whether or not we considered you know, what the wolf's experience was. Now, naturally, if you've read that book, you know it's satire. You know that the wolf is what we call in literary circles an unreliable narrator. He is a half-baked defense away from staying out of prison. It's basically the idea. And so you're reading this book, and as an adult, you're chuckling. And your child, my child, Noah, was sort of trying to determine, well, is it true? And so one of the questions that I asked myself, even at the time was, Noah is being even controlled right now by my laughter. Like he's mm -hmm. hearing the story through the lens of this wolf and my laughter is shaping whether or not he trusts it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then I asked myself the question, well, what would have happened if he heard the wolf's version for over and over for his little three years and only heard the pig's version later? Right. Which would he suspect? How would he know who to trust? What rhetoric would make the most sense to him? Interestingly, I shared this story in my staff, Brave Writer, and I have some young staff members who are about the ages of my adult kids, 34, 35. And one of them, when, we were, when she read the chapter said, I read that book before I really knew the Three Little Pigs story and I assumed the wolf was telling the truth. Wow. I that want is to share that because when we are looking at any piece of writing then or any television programming, the first question to ask is, says who? Says who? So they watch a show and rather than asking an esoteric, just who's telling this story? Whose story is not being told? Whose story might be interesting to hear? Uh, what would it sound like if a person outside the story told it versus a person who's living it? These are the places we can begin to at least open the door to a child asking a question like, what is the source and why do I trust it or not trust it? You can even ask questions like, when you heard the wolf speaking, did it make you uncomfortable? Did it make you laugh? What um, body clues do you have that you're hearing a different story and having to process it differently? You know, why would we trust the pigs? What do they have at stake? These are the kinds of questions we can ask our kids. So interesting. And, and I think of how we've received backstories on fairy tales, like, you know, we had the Wizard of Oz and then you get Wicked, you know, where you get the backstory of what yes. happened with the witch. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, now I can have empathy for this character in a unique way. So I can imagine using those same types of questions with that kind of story and then going further with whatever program or film that you're watching, if it's being told from a particular perspective that now you can flip it or even ones that provide you with a dual perspective, like something like Freaky Friday, yes. where you get two different perspectives that make it so you now understand both characters by the end. And then they understand themselves by being able to look out of a, the, the other person's eyes. Would you agree? 
Oh, totally. And there are so many amazing ways to do this. So there are books like Wonder, where mm. each chapter is a different character's yes. perspective of the same story. Uh, there's a movie out right now, a Matt Damon movie called The Last Duel. So for adults, that one has the same story told through three perspectives. It's very powerful. They just keep redoing it. There are movies like Run, Lola, Run that shows different outcomes. But when we're talking with children, uh, one of the ways to do this, uh, we have an activity in Brave Writer that I will share with your audience. Mm. You can gather a variety of versions of fairy tales. So for instance, just think about Rapunzel. You might have a Golden Books version. You might watch the Disney version of Tangled. Mm -hmm. You might find other storytellers who adopt that storyline in another culture. Mm -hmm. And if you read four, five, six of them in a row and watch movies and have conversations and do drawings and dress up clothes, like really get to know the story. At the end of that journey, it could take even a month or more. You can ask your child to narrate their own personalized version of that story that you jot down for them, have them draw an illustration. And you could do this over a course of months where they are literally writing their own point of view version of the fairy tale drawn from multiple sources. Mm -hmm. Literally, that's college mm -hmm. happening for a six-year-old. That mm -hmm. is the academic mindset that critical thinking is not about the right view, it's getting more views. It's actually mm -hmm. expanding the field of vision, inviting other voices, asking who's being left out of the conversation, seeking original documents, not just reports on original documents, right? This yes. is how we grow a mind. And so a lot of people ask me, oh, is this book about politics? Well, I'm not writing a screed about a political position. I'm inviting us to consider how we even hold those positions and what are all the sources we're allowing to come into the field of vision so that we can think deeper and wider. Yeah, I, it's interesting, even as an as an adult, and you know, since you write and you know, understand this this perspective, that when you're writing and you're doing writing based on research uh, and re you know studies that are being done or uh, experiences that other people have had, you often do read things, read reports based on studies, which may actually clue you in about the study, which is it's very useful, but. I found many times now that I will read something and it's reporting on a study and I'll see the same thing over and over and over again. And then when I actually pull up the study, somebody had gotten it wrong, but it had been repeated so many times that it was taken as the truth. I mean, this literally happened. I don't remember which chapter I was writing for how to talk to kids about anything, but it was about a, psych a psychologist who typically writes about couples, but the information was being applied to kids, but inappropriately so. And But it had been quoted so many times that people had taken it verbatim. They had like said, this is the truth. And then I went back, 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 back to the very beginning. And I was like, this is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, well, you know, one of the things that you, you know, you were talking about here is, and you talk about in the book is this idea that these kids come from this perspective of wonder from such an early age, this curiosity, but then somehow it's like stamped out over a period of time as they're getting older. I think you quoted like by age 10 or something, yes, like they have exactly. got like nothing left. Right. So, and it is about getting the answer correct. Uh, I remember you talking about the perspective of like that little tree that was on the page and is, should this be measured in inches, feet or blah, blah, blah. And the guy, the little kid wrote or centimeters, he wrote centimeters and the other, and clearly that was wrong. It should be measured in feet because it's a tree, but he's like, no, it's on the paper. It's like, how many centimeters could this be? Like five <laughs> centimeters? I think, I mean, that was just so illuminating. So Clearly, we we know that education, if we take a step back, really should be more than memorizing dates and, and details. So what are some tools that you would say that would help to generate insight rather than relying on this getting things right while talking to our kids, especially when the pressure is really about them getting things right in school? How do we deal with uh. that? 
it is tricky when your kids are being raised in an environment that has this coercive element, right? So there is a teacher, there's a school board, there's a curriculum, there's a test with right answers. But I think we can just talk about those things that in the classroom setting, part of what a teacher is trying to make happen is a shortcut to ensure that students are following the patterns, learning the theories, mastering the data. But then at home, we should have the freedom to discuss. It might be interesting to pull out a multiple choice test that your student got even got a good grade on and say, what are other ways to think about these answers? Mm -hmm. What other possibilities might have occurred to you that you excluded? Let's go one step further. Um, when you were talking about sort of the way data comes to us and how studies can be misinterpreted, I immediately thought of author Joel Best. He is known for his high quality books all about how to evaluate statistics. And he has this one quote that I loved. I quoted it in my book. He said, a bad stat is harder to kill than a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> and really the truth of the matter is what our kids are trying to contend with is how do they retain space to be risk taking thinkers when they're in a system that's asking them to be accurate responders. Mm -hmm. And so at home and in sports and in piano, let's encourage more risk taking to offset that tendency in school. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example. You might have a child who comes to you and says, I want to quit, you know, cheerleading. I don't want to do it anymore. And the parent whose child led will be like, I've got to honor the feelings of my child. I'm going to let that child quit. A parent who, let's say, is really into athletics and thinks this is really healthy for the child might say, you can't quit. I know this is good for you, right? But actually, we're in the middle of a critical thinking moment. Here's hmm. what we can do instead. Instead of it being a binary, child-led or parent-led, bigger vision or more limited vision, we can ask the child, tell me more about that. What about cheer no longer works for you? Can you describe that for me? Well, now we're starting to open the self-awareness door and your child might say something that really surprises you. Well, the last week when I was doing, you know, back handsprings, I felt really uncomfortable having a boy coach. Mm. And you're suddenly like, oh, she doesn't want to quit cheer. She's having a new experience and it's uncomfortable. Maybe we need to talk about that. Now, it may even take her time to get there. She may just start with, it's really boring. I don't like my friends anymore. The coach is mean. But if you stay with it, you can ask follow-up questions. Things like, well, right now you've been in the same troupe for you know six years. Do you just need a change of scenery? Mm. Um, have you looked at where cheer might take you? Uh, is there an actual skill that you're being asked to do that feels really scary? Uh, that happened to me with my son in lacrosse. He was one of the best players and he got a concussion twice in one season. Mm. And what he started saying was, I hate lacrosse. What he was really saying is, I no longer want to get concussed, right? Mm -hmm. But a parent who's pushing an agenda or a parent who's caving to a child's in the moment feeling might not ever actually discover what drove that feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, I played piano as a kid. And after five years of composing my own music, I loved it. I wanted to quit. And my parents just let me quit. And what I needed was a different experience. My piano teacher was too limited. I had explored and exhausted everything she had taught me. She was starting to get a little too close to me, like inappropriate interest mm. in my dating life. I was like 13. And what I really needed is for my mom to say, you know, there are other ways to do piano. So this is what critical thinking is. It's helping your kids take risks in thinking, articulate mm -hmm. their truths, and find a receptive audience that can ask follow-up questions that help them feel more and more comfortable with the thoughts they're having. It sounds like that when somebody says something initially, it's like just the first layer, and you have to can you know, peel that back and, and keep looking for what the truth might be so that what is really going on can be uncovered. You can't just take the first thing that your child says necessarily as the thing that's going on. Is that correct? Absolutely. And in fact, I know that this could start to feel like a burden, you know, <laughs> like the child says, I don't want to wash my hands. You could, you know, we usually go right into parent propaganda, right? I don't want to wash my hands before dinner. 
honey. There are these invisible things you can't see. I know you're six and they're on your hands and you can't see them and they'll make you sick. And the child's like, well, I didn't wash my hands last night and I'm not sick. And then the parent comes back with more propaganda and scientific studies the child doesn't care about. If you really found out that the child doesn't like the feel of their water, the water on their hands, well, could we use hand sanitizer? Mm -hmm. Could we use a wipe? Like you could do that, but with every decision, that's a lot. Oh, yes. But I invite you to do it once in a while. And when like, it ma really matters. When it really matters. You might have a child who says uh, something like this. I want to play video games for 24 hours straight. Ooh. And to a parent that just sounds outrageous and you just clamp down on it, that's not a good idea. But on the flip side, like, what is it about that that's enticing? So if we could start there, oh, 24 whole hours. What do you imagine would happen in 24 hours of game playing? Mm -hmm. And then your child says, well, I'd beat all the levels and I wouldn't have to take turns with my brother. Well, when would you pee? <laughs> oh, well, I, I'd get up to pee. Well, would your brother take the computer then? Oh yeah, he might. Um, well, how would you keep him from taking it? And you just like go down the road. Mm -hmm. And what if you got to the end and you're like, okay, we're going to do it. I want to see you do 24 hours, but I'm putting some money on this. If you go 24 hours, I'm donating this money to this charity mm -hmm. on your behalf. And then you could even say, maybe we should see if other people want to do that. You know, I was in a dance marathon in college and that's what we did. And then like actually lean into it as an experiment. Did he last? Mm -hmm. What kind of food did he need? How often did he pee? What was mm -hmm. the outcome of this? But we are so quick to do things that are good for our kids that we forget to give them the opportunity to de develop their own data, to actually mm. know by their own research whether something's good for them or not. Right. And you can check in, you can have your opinions. Uh, when I asked my oldest son, what is one of your favorite memories from his childhood? He cited the day that I allowed them to play on the computers from the morning until they went to bed mm. out of his whole childhood. Wow. That's so really saying something. <laughs> it's powerful, right? They really yeah. love gaming and gaming. Speaking of research, gaming research initially was very fraught with defensiveness and assignation to crime. And the current research has overturned a lot of that. But similar to your earlier statement, that stuff just keeps being recycled and cited. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite studies talked about how the imagination gets catalyzed in gaming from a safe distance. So even games like Grand Theft Auto, which is all rule breaking and driving on the sidewalks and picking up hookers. And I mean, it's like nothing any parent values. They said, but it does allow a child or a teen, let's say a teen, uh, to be immersed in a world where lawlessness is risk free. Mm. It's a chance to even wonder what that would be like. So a dinner table conversation is like, can you imagine? if this was really actually reality. Mm. Those, we can be using what we're afraid of to actually grow minds is my mm. point. I think that whole thing is fascinating to, to do that. And of course, when they can experience something and gather their own data, they might say, I used to think <laughs> that I'd like to do 24 hours of gaming, but as it turns out, seven hours is enough. <laughs> and then I want to do something else. I mean, you don't know. I, you know, I, I actually want to sleep. I actually like to eat. I actually like to uh, watch a movie with the family. I actually want to go outside with my best friend. I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they wouldn't, but they would come to that own conclusion instead of you being the one who's saying those things. And when they say it themselves, of course, it's the truth. And when you say it can be argued with. So it makes it much more powerful. Well, yes. To go the and, other way. and let's just remember that we can change our minds at any point. Mm -hmm. Parents are always worried about consistency. I think consistency is kind of unhelpful. It's fine that we have regular meals and that your kids don't have to worry about shelter and that they have a routine to their days. I'm not saying that. But critical thinking is the ability to pivot when the data changes. It's right. the ability to go where information leads you. So just having a one for all time requirement, like if a child starts a sport and they really hate it, finishing what you really hate, is that the model that we're trying to teach our children about mm. adulthood. I have this catchphrase in my community called being an awesome adult. 
a lot of adults go around shaming their kids about having fun because someday a boss is going to say you can't be late and you'll have to pay a bill and life is hard and they make adulthood look burdensome, responsible and weary. Mm -hmm. And then they wonder why their kids just want to be Peter Pan and play on games all day. Mm -hmm. But what if your adulthood actually included things you were passionate about, yes. time away from your children, um, things you're learning and changing your mind about that you reveal so that your kids can see that you're still a growing thinking person? Yes. And then they look forward to adulthood because by the time they're 26, they'll get to go kayaking without an adult with them. Mm -hmm. They'll get to read whatever they want to read, like make adulting awesome in right. your own life. So they have something to aspire to besides weary responsibility. Fascinating. Yes. I like all of that. Uh, I, one of the reasons why I decided to go back into doing my singing lessons was partly to kind of recapture some joy, but also partly so that my kids could see that I, I like to do other things besides sit in my chair with my hair up on top of my head, writing a book and, and that I am a multifaceted person. And it can be when you're an adult, you can actually find a way to do work, but also do certain things that make you happy and, and that you're passionate about. I, I do want them to see that that's really important. Uh, so I appreciate what you're saying there. Now, our children are, are growing up in specific contexts. So we, as we've established, like obviously all of that information is going to shape how they think. And we have their everyday in-person world at school and in their after-school programs. But we also have these online worlds, this social media, gaming, as you're mentioning. So how would you say school experiences and internet searches can then influence how children think? And then how can we, with like something specific, expand their minds? Besides these questions that you're asking here, what are some like tangible things that we might be able to do to expand their minds when we know the context they're living in? So good. Uh, I am a big fan of board games and card games as a tool because there's so much negotiation that goes on in those games. But mm -hmm. here are some tips for how to make those more interesting. Change the rules. Hmm. Break the rules. See if you can fail at the game first. What would that be like? In other words, start to introduce contradiction into a child's assumptions. And you can do that through these practical activities. I remember um, playing basketball outside with one of my kids and we started assigning point values to different shots. This one's worth 10, this one's worth three. And how did that change the game and the strategy and the way that we think about playing? When we're talking about all of these sort of esoteric skills with kids, it starts at a very baseline, like start with their actual experience. We might for dinner, start with dessert. We might let a kid decide that all the foods have to be the same color. How does that change how we feel about eating? So introduce some breaking a rule, introduce experiences and encounters. You know, don't just read about another culture. Uh, I remember when we lived in Los Angeles, we went and visited Little Saigon as a family. Mm -hmm. And as we were driving in, suddenly the billboards were in Vietnamese characters, like we couldn't read them. We actually met people who had traveled by boat during the boat people refugee crisis, who shared their stories with us personally, not just through reading. So when we're talking about helping our kids deal with their identities, we want to elevate their experiences and introduce them to encounters. For instance, you could read all day long about violin, but if you've never heard one played, have you really learned anything about violin? No. And if you want to, <clears throat> if you want to kick it up a notch, put the violin in your child's hands. Similarly, if we're going to read about, let's say, the enslavement period of US history, <clears throat> I live in Cincinnati. We've got a museum here that traces that history. We have um, a, a safe house from the Underground Railroad that our family visited wow. on a cold January morning. We met people who have 
ancestors who were enslaved people, we change the, the knowledge base when we add experience and we create encounters for our kids. So those are activities that you can do that help them with identity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and obviously we talked about books earlier uh, and, and making sure that I would imagine that you want uh, books that show all different kinds of people all For different sure. kinds of topics. Uh, I really do try to do that. My kids, both my kids, now one of them mainly is like was obsessed with graphic novels. Oh, and perfect. My, my son is fully still there. Okay, my daughter has has moved forward more to you know all these series books and and is my kids are definitely like readers. So my so son, good. so being, good. Yeah, it is really good. I, I, you know, when you're, when you find yourself at like 1030 at night and go, you know, finding yourself saying these words, like you really need to stop reading and go to bed. It's like, you start to realize what am I saying exactly right now? So uh, (laughs) wait a second, but I think with the graph, like with graphic novels, They've come such a long way. It's like amazing oh, what's out there right they're now. Incredi- they're incredible. They're incredible. Agreed. And and I just get, I just get all of them. Like I, I'd be, if it's a graphic novel that looks like something he like would be interested in in any way, I get it. And um, so he has yeah, just been I, exposed to so much. So part of what's so cool about graphic novels is that they pair this visual media that yeah. kids are being raised in yes. with the written words. So for kids who are struggling readers yes. in particular, or don't feel they can read a whole chapter book alone, mm-hmm. starting with a graphic novel is great. I was just looking Perfect. on my website. One of the series we recommend is Hereville, How Mirka Got Her Sword mm-hmm. by Barry Deutsch. Um, there's a whole series of those that are just amazing. Mm-hmm. And of course, uh, Mira is this strong-willed 11 year old and she comes from um, a strong religious background and yet is a superhero with a sword and so you get exposed Mm -hmm. to another perspective george takei has a great graphic novel that he wrote about his family's experience during the internment camps in the united states so these introduce a world Mm -hmm. to a reader both visually Um, and through writing. Persepolis, another amazing series. In addition to that, we do want to curate a library of what I call variety uh, in terms of authorship and content, but also genre. It's really important to read original letters, to read nonfiction, to read poetry and fables, to read myths and legends, to read other religious traditions besides your own. As you expose your children to this variety, both in terms of authorship and style of writing, you also are including this diversity of perspectives and ways of expressing experience, data, research, reporting. This is the academic task. I mean, if you have a graduate degree or a PhD, this is like second nature to you. But for some reason, during the elementary years in particular, we forget that that's what we're training them for. Um, And it's not so that they can get a PhD. If they want to, they can. It's so they can be a well-rounded human being with Mm -hmm. access to a variety of ways of knowing how we exist in the world. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because I'm such a fan of a variety of perspectives, even first person versus omniscient narrative versus third person. These are all different ways of seeing. Um, One of the tools in my book, in fact, is called Keen Observation. And one of the ways that we foster a greater appreciation of something is to deepen our vocabulary. So you could do this activity at home, have an array of objects on a table, have your child pick one to deeply investigate with their five senses. I give you a whole bunch of questions to ask and start to generate more. Like for instance, I'm holding up right now a black mug and you would say it's black with white writing. But then what I would say to my child is, look at the black more carefully. Are there any other colors on the black? And suddenly they notice there's a reflection. You can see white on the edges and a white line because there's a window reflecting. That is a a perception that they would have overlooked without a deeper investigation. That's training them. Mm 
right? Mm -hmm. To keenly mm -hmm. observe when they're overlooking, when they're a little too quick to summarize or generalize. So I've got a whole series of how we do that, even at the level of social issues in the book. But keenly observing is the foundation of all academic research. Uh, I said the other day, research is just academic code for intimacy. Mm. We're trying to cultivate not certainty, but intimacy, knowing the subject more with more of ourselves. Mm. Mm. Yes, a fascinating way of looking at everything and making sure that your children are stepping back and looking at other aspects of, of what's speaking to them, what's making them think a certain way. I, I really loved your chapter on identity. I, I've written all over the book um, in that in that chapter. I mean, oh everything it's like underlines. And my son came in last night to say goodnight to me. And and I'm writing in the book. And he says to me, what are you doing? And I said, I'm reading this book. And he said, it looks like you're writing in the book. I'm like, well, that is how I read. Actually, <laughs> I read with I a pen in my that. hand. I was taught to do that from seventh grade on to read with a pen in my hand. I find it really hard to read a book without that. I mean, fiction Same. I do, but nonfiction, I need a pen in my hand and Same. I'm, you know, just writing and stars and asking questions and, you know, expand on this and <laughs> all over the place. So I really loved that section. Um, I thought that this was so well said that identity is who we are, how others see us and who we want to be if something that I've, of that sort, you were quoting yes. somebody. And, and I loved that. And that we're shaped by the context, um, our context, but also how we interact with that context and how we see that context is shaped by our own identity. So this is where, like, this is a conversation that I definitely want to have like, where biases and privilege and lenses and filters. I, I'd like to live here for a minute because great. I'd, I'd, I'd like to give you, let's give some scenarios so that we can sort of see how this plays out and, right. and so people can kind of hear it. So let's, let's say, I mean, we didn't deal with the race thing before gender or whatever, but like, let's say that you live in a family and in a community where race, like your race is like really celebrated. You feel really good about where you come from, the color of your skin, like what it says about you um, versus living in a family or community or in a school where you feel like race is looked down upon. So if you have one of those two filters, how would identity shape how you're thinking in those two different contexts? That's, that's so, it's such a powerful thing. And of course, we have to acknowledge too that there are individual differences even within those experiences. Uh, but for instance, I grew up in a fairly affluent, mostly Jewish community. I wasn't Jewish. I'm white uh, by race. Um, and there was a high uh, emphasis on academics and a very good school district. So I grew up, despite being a female in the 60s and 70s, believing that all opportunities were open to me and that I was capable to walk through those doors. I also saw myself represented in television, in ads, in all the stories I read. And it never occurred to me that there were people who weren't being represented. That's right. how much. Add to that, I grew up in Southern California in a place that everyone knows now, Calabasas Park, because that's where the Kardashians live. It's near Malibu. And when I would travel and people would ask where I was from, and I would say Malibu or Los Angeles, people always reacted really positively. So I grew up with this sense of opportunity, that I was from the right place, that I deserved what I got. That's how I saw my life as a young person. When I was in grad school, I had a professor who on the first day of class, he was teaching about American history and the civil rights movement. And he started class by saying, I was in second grade and they told a story about the founding of the United States. And it went like this. These three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, crossed a hard sea, arrived on a new world shore, and built a, a nation from scratch. And I listened to him say it, and I was like, yeah, that's the story as I know it. 
And then he said, he's African-American, black man. And he said in that moment, he said, Who, whose story was mm -hmm. that not? It was the first time that anyone had ever said that language to me. And he said, I sat in my second grade classroom knowing that my people came over on different boats, the Amistad, slavers. And he said, and no one was talking about it. Mm -hmm. He said, a Native American indigenous is sitting in that chair knowing we were here first and no one's talking about it. So when we talk about the experience of race, that's why I think self-awareness is so critical. When we talk about privilege or we talk about your identity, what we're really saying is what is invisible to you, what feels like your natural state of being, your skin, all the messages you've been receiving, it's invisible to you. So when someone from outside, like Adam did for me in that classroom, Dr. Clark, when he said, who was left out? Whose narrative isn't this? It's like popping me out of this invisible, taken for granted self-understanding. You said in your book, like you were quoting somebody about the knapsack of The knapsack privileges. of white privilege, right. yes. Right, like there was like, and an and, and, and undeserved, like all these things that you kind of like take for granted that you get and that you walk into a space with that th these are things that you have to bring up and sort of out of the shadows. Is that correct there? That's exactly right. It's Peggy McIntosh. It's called The Knapsack of Privilege. She and I share a birth date. I don't know why that just continues to tickle me. But basically <laughs> what she is saying is privilege is just the sense that doors are open for you in whatever category. Now, I've had the good fortune of living abroad twice. I lived in Central Africa for a summer, and then I spent four years living in North Africa. And in both cases, being American is still considered something you can be proud of. But however comma, big comma, living in those places meant that I immediately was at a disadvantage. And I'll never forget, I had a grad, uh, you know, I graduated from UCLA, I was in my 20s. Uh, I was really good at writing and reading and all these things. And I get there and the first woman, our landlady for our apartment, so the first woman I'm hanging out with says, so let's make bread. What kind of bread do you make? And I'm like, bread? Wow. I've never made bread in my life. <laughs> and when I told her that, she said, well, then you are not a woman. You are still oh. a girl and you have not completed your education. And that was one of those moments where I realized, oh, the tools of measurement I use to make myself feel good are different in different places. Mm -hmm. And now I'm suddenly knocked off of my center and she repeatedly humbled me. I mean, I was learning Arabic, I misused it, right? Like all those things. Privilege is the feeling that your spoken language, your behaviors, your actions are going to benefit you. Mm -hmm. And a lack of privilege is that you have to overcome barriers to get those same opportunities. And in my case, being, you know, sort of a, an expatriate, a foreigner who moved into this country, I was choosing it deliberately. Imagine growing up in a place that is your home and it feels like you are being treated like an expatriate all the time. Mm. That is not a good feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And and it 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 does it has such an an impact when you're in a space where you feel that you're not good enough and that you there's nothing you can do right to make it so. So uh, I was curious also when reading your book about how billboards and films and books and social media, like all of those kinds of things also shape who we are. Ugh. We've got a multi-billion dollar diet industry, beauty industry. Right. How do you see media as it impacts things like body image and self-image and, and the, what you, what you want to look like um, and our, our ability to change that so how can teaching critical thinking assist with those issues? Gosh, I love that. You know, social media can really be a double-edged sword. It can reinforce all those stereotypes and make us feel worse about ourselves. 
But there is a staggering number of counter narrative accounts that yes. exist on social media. And I remember my two daughters saying to me, Mom, you need to start following all of these accounts where they're body positive and where they're focused on actually uh, feeling good in your body and what you wear. Because I've always been kind of into fashion. I grew up in LA and that was just a way that, you know, my mom and I enjoyed a lot of things together. And I have to tell you, in the last three years, I've been following these accounts that are showing us like how the filters are used, how the you know manipulations are happening to the graphics. Um, and then people who are different body types than I used to think were attractive. And it has completely changed how I see bodies. Mm. I think one of the ways that we help ourselves isn't to just be antagonistic all the time, but it's literally to choose new inputs that will help shape a difference. You know, it's sort of like when you're trying to get your child to eat vegetables, right? If they're never introduced to a vegetable in a way that tastes good, they're just going to be resistant. So mm -hmm. I remember like with Noah, I made pumpkin pie for like a year because it was the one way I could get him to eat a vegetable, but I actually made the pumpkin from scratch. Like he wow. would pick it out of the store and watch me boil it so that he could see, well, this is a vegetable, not just that it was a pie. Mm. And I think that's kind of what I'm saying. We want to reshape our own imaginations first and then introduce to our kids, if we see this body image, you know, kind of spiraling in a child or an eating disorder erupt, to actually address it in those meaningful ways. Not only get them help, but show them the alternatives they maybe don't even know exist. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. when we're talking about like the, the onslaught, there does need to be a pause button and adults are as bad at it as kids. Uh, I really do urge a deep reading practice where phones are put away and we treat it almost like yoga or exercise or training for a marathon. We read without all that assault where we don't have to have an opinion yet. And we can just let the ideas live inside of us unsupervised for seven to 10 minutes a day. Mm, mm. I could talk to you all day. Unfortunately, you know, I don't think we have 24 hours. So <laughs> please complete this sentence. The most important thing we must do to raise critical thinkers is. Be curious and fascinated more than convinced and persuaded. Mm. Yes, let's let that land. That whole idea of being curious and allowing your children to be curious, going against the grain, going against what other people are saying, asking questions that seem provocative, that might seem not PC because they are not burdened by all of that and they can ask questions. So when we invite the curiosity and they can talk it out with you in a safe place, it allows them to develop their own views and not simply be empty vessels that we fill right. in with all the, all the facts, not really, maybe that, that are out there. Give us your top tip. What do you hope people come away with after listening to this podcast and reading your book and, and really understanding the importance of critical thinking. I hope that parents will feel closer to their children at the end of reading the book and implementing some of these strategies and that they will make their home a safe place for risky thinking. Mm. And the reason that I think that is the key is that there are too many places where kids are feeling that they must have a secret life secret beliefs, they're driving their actual thoughts underground to retain parental approval. Mm -hmm. But the one place, they, the one community that can't kick them out should be their families. Thank you for that. That's for sure. Give us your resource of the week. Where can we go to get more information about you, your work, and the book you wrote? Thank you. Go to raisingcriticalthinkers.com. I have a free download that comes with, uh, you know, af it's after you purchase the book, it's to support hosting a book club. I hope people will read these ideas and have conversations about them. 
Uh, and then if you're interested in support for writing, please check out bravewriter.com. We have a seven day writing blitz that is implementing these ideas through writing and is totally fun. Day one is called graffiti. And so, yeah, your kids will be writing on all kinds of surfaces and it is a way to bust out of the habitual thinking about writing. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. That sounds like a really interesting thing to do. And I want to thank you so very much, Julie, for your insights, your strategies, for being on the show today. I, I just loved all of this information regarding identity, regarding bias, about opening your minds in all these different ways, the questions that you pose. They are fascinating and they are needed to help our kids break free from the linear thinking that they so often do because that's what we teach to more creative and curious thinking that will help them to really engage with the world and make important contributions that only they can make. So thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you, Robin. This was such a pleasurable conversation and I admire your work. Thank you for including me. Mm. Thank you. Well, I have got my takeaways and sweet friends. I know you have yours. So let's discuss them. Come up on Facebook. You can go to the Dr. Robin Silverman page or let's chat about it at drrobinsilverman.com or twitter.com slash Dr. Robin. I'm also on Instagram under Dr. Robin Silverman. And if you love this podcast like I did, I hope you'll go up to iTunes and rate and review it. I can't tell you how much it is needed. It is appreciated. When you do give me that fabulous five-star review, it really helps all the algorithms that I don't really know all about, but I do know that it helps with exposure. And then more people will learn about people like Julie and listen to what she's saying and then read her book and the world will change. So all you need to do is go up to iTunes and rate and review the podcast. That's all the time we have for today, my fellow parents, leaders, and educators. Thank you so much for tuning in to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com. There's so many great podcasts up there, and the show notes to this podcast will be up there as well. I look forward to weathering the storms and enjoying the sunny side of life together. And please remember... Even on the days when you fall short, you've got this, you're here, you're getting the information you need. I know it's not easy, but never forget there's always tomorrow. Parenting, it's the ultimate do-over. You may have heard something today and you're thinking, I should have said this, I should have asked that. Why did I squelch what he said? Why didn't I get this book? I told him to put it away. It's okay. We can always have a do-over. We can always go back and say, I'd like to do this differently. Can we talk about that thing again? I said something that I actually thought about and I said, eh, I'd actually like to tell you this instead. You always have the opportunity to do that. I see you and I'm right there with you. And as there are moments where we doubt our know-how, our choices and our sweet sanity, please know that you are 10 times the parent you think you are. Until next time, this is Dr. Robin Silverman with How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Please tune in again and keep connecting through conversation. See you next week. You've been listening to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com.